for the kind introduction, Ryan, and thank you all for coming out today. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting uh, some ongoing research that I've been conducting on the link between language and separatism in Eurasia, uh, and today I'm going to be focusing, as Merlin noted, on survey results from a survey conducted in two separatist regions of the post-Soviet state of Moldova. So this is part of a larger general project on how language can relate to separatism across the world, but the impetus for this presentation today was that there has been a lot of discussion in the media, among policymakers and elsewhere, about the relationship between the Russian language and more specifically the presence of Russian speakers and the risk of separatism in post-Soviet states. So there's good reason for this to be discussed, obviously, uh, with uh, the annexation of Crimea and then also the conflict in eastern Ukraine, where language was used as a justification or protecting the rights of Russian speakers was used as a justification for Russian intervention and also this, this conflict. So the, but it, we're, if we go a little bit beyond Ukraine, there have been continuing discussions in places ranging from northern Kazakhstan to the Baltic states about the potential risk of separatism among Russian speakers in these territories. And so the question is, why do people think that there should be this risk, or why, why is there this potential correlation between Russian-speaking populations and support for separatism? So one explanation, and probably I would argue a relatively facile one, is that this is just a smokescreen for Russian interests. So it doesn't really matter if there are Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine, but this is just sort of great power politics, and Russia wanted to interfere in Russian and uh, Ukrainian politics, and therefore uh, uh, this conflict emerged. Another, uh, I think, other explanation that I think is missing a larger point is that this is not really a language struggle, or in general when we're talking about language politics, there's an argument that this isn't really about language at all, but it's really just a proxy for ethnic identity. So when people are talking about protect protecting Russian speakers, what they really mean is that we're protecting ethnic Russians, and language is sort of a more politically correct way of saying that. And then the final explanation, and the one that I want to look at, uh, I'm going to be investigating a great deal today, is that this is actually related to the preferences of Russian speakers. So the argument is that uh, the sort of relationship between Russian proficiency and support for separatism in the former Soviet Union that we observe is actually reflective of underlying preferences of uh, people who speak the language. And what I'm arguing is that this is part of a larger general class of uh, types of dynamics, which I'm referring to as set of periphery linguistic dynamics. We have a, a territorial concentrated population that speaks a language that is distinct from that of a central state and thus come to believe that their uh, linguistic status or the status of their language and thus their rights as speaker of that, speakers of that language is tied to territorial autonomy, so thus tied to separatism. So just a brief definitional note, when I'm talking about separatism today, I'm not talking about secessionism, which is a desire to create an independent state, but rather a more general concept, which is separatism, which ranges from desiring greater territorial autonomy up to and including secessionism, or attempts to uh, align with a larger state outside of your current state. So the argument is that Russian speakers, um, especially in some of the cases I'm going to be discussing, see the, their language as being tied to territorial autonomy and thus are more likely to support separatist activities in general. Uh, before I give you a more general roadmap of this discussion, I first want to mention um, one thing really, really clear which is that uh, these are not mutually exclusive ca categories. So especially when we're talking about Ukraine, uh, I'm not arguing that it was purely preferences of Russian speakers in the territory that led to this conflict, but rather it was some combination of these things. But if we ignore the bottom uh, aspect for just the top two, we're going to be making bad uh, policy decisions and bad sort of understanding of what actually is that, uh, happening there. So. Uh, today what I'm going to do is first provide a theoretical overview of why we might expect there to be a link between uh, language and support for separatism more generally. Then I'm going to be providing a very broad strokes description of separatist activities in Moldova, which is the country that I'm going to be focusing on. And then I'm going to present some results from a survey I conducted in two separatist regions of Moldova in 2013. <coughs> So one of these regions is Transnistria, which has been de facto independent since the 1990s, and the other one is Gagarizia, <coughs> which is uh, an autonomous territorial unit within Moldova proper. Then I'm going to conclude with some policy implications. Uh, one thing to note here, I think especially given this crowd, if people have any clarification questions or want to interrupt for any other reason, well, not any other reason, but especially <laughs> if people have clarification <coughs> questions, please feel free to ask me to uh, repeat something or go into a little bit more detail. So. Uh, first, with the theoretical explanation. So why might we expect uh, language to be tied to separatist activity? So this goes back to uh, very uh, relatively early scholarship on separatism, and specifically the work of Ernest Gellner, uh, which argues that you're going to see separatism to, uh, as being most likely among groups that share a common identity, 
Often in the literature, this is glossed over as being ethnic identity or a myth or an idea of shared kinship among members of a group. And then uh, when you have one of these groups, uh, which I'm just going to be referring more generally as a peripheral group, uh, that shares this common identity and believes that it faces permanently blocked social mobility in a larger state, so they're going to have lower opportunities within a larger state of which uh, they're a part, they're going to first try to raise the status of their group, and if that fails within a larger state, they're then going to try to create a territorial entity where their rights are going to be better protected, i.e. they're going to engage in separatism. Uh, what I argue is that language fulfills these criteria for uh, the aspects of groups that will potentially be uh, most likely to engage in separatist activity. And I argue this for three uh, reasons. So the first one is that language is a really important aspect of identity. I don't think this is a terribly controversial <laughs> claim to make, um, but if you go back to fundamental works on nationalism, such as Benedict Anderson, there's this idea that uh, a shared... Uh, um, a shared a common language and a shared script allows otherwise distinct or different individuals to conceptualize themselves as being part of a larger group and thus uh, to start beginning uh, to develop nationalist sentiments and desires to make the state and the nation more sort of uh, cor correlated with each other. Um, and then I think even if we take a more sort of broad view, being able to talk to people, being able to share common media, all of this is able to incorporate a common sense of identity among people who speak the same language regardless of their background, be it ethnic or otherwise. And then the second element I think is more sort of unique to language. And here I'm glossing uh, the terminology of Kanchan Chandra, who's worked a lot about what things make certain identities salient. And my argument is that language is both noticeable and difficult to change. Now when I say that language is noticeable, I mean that everyone uses language to communicate, and your relative fluency in a given language is immediately noticeable to your interlocutors. So you all have probably figured out that I'm a native English speaker. Maybe you know that I uh, have an upper Midwest dialect. I can guarantee you if I was giving, this conversa uh, giving you this presentation in Russian, none of you would think that I was a native Russian speaker. <laughs> if I was lucky, you'd say, Kyle, he speaks Russian really well for an American, but he's got an accent. Um, but the important thing is that you would know that I am not a member of the Russian native speaking group. Uh, this is important because language is also difficult to change. And this has sort of two different levels. So the first one is, that in general, for anyone to learn a new language requires a whole lot of time and resources. So if you all of a sudden need to learn a new language, you're going to need to take language courses, you're going to need to do homework, you're going to need to speak to a lot of different people in this language. What all this means is that if you don't have the time and resources to learn an important language uh, for your society, it means that it's going to be really difficult for you to succeed. Now, even if we uh, accept that um, you have uh, the necessary time and the resources to develop a sort of basic level fluency or even advanced fluency in a new language. There's a broad literature on uh, psycholinguistics that basically demonstrates that developing native level fluency, so developing skills in a language such that a native speaker considers you a member of their group, is generally impossible for most adults. So you're always going to have an accent or some sort of marker that says that you're not a native speaker. So if I were to move to uh, Russia, live there for the rest of my life, uh, take a um, bunch of Russian courses. When I die, people might say, Kyle, he spoke um, in, uh, Russian really, really well for an American, but they wouldn't say, Kyle, he spoke Russian without any accent, which means that um, r whatever I do, I will still be known as someone who's not a member of that group. Now, this all comes together vis-a-vis -vis, uh, separatism and support for separatism, and that language is also essential for social mobility. So being able to speak the main language of a state, or what I'm referring to as a metropolitan language, is essential for gaining a good education or getting a high prestige job. So if you don't speak English in the United States, you can't go to a very good university. Uh, same goes for Germany and German, same goes for Russia and in Russia. Uh, <coughs> which means that if you are an adult who all of a sudden needs to learn one of these languages, you're going to have to have a whole lot of time and resources to develop skills, and even once you do that, you still might uh, be discriminated against because of an accent. Uh, so this all links back to these original claims that I was talking about, in the sense that when you have a linguistic group, these are people who share a common identity, and if they don't necessarily speak the metropolitan language of the state, they're also going to face potentially permanently blocked social mobility within that state, and thus they're going to see a link between their life prospects and the status of their language, and if that's not something that they can alter within a state, they're going to want to get greater territorial autonomy. <coughs> so this leads to two main uh, empirical predictions that I'm going to be investigating uh, throughout this presentation. And the first one is that proficiency in a common peripheral language increases support for separatism. 
uh, and as the corollary, proficiency in a metropolitan language will decrease support for separatism. Now, this ties into the former Soviet Union in the sort of change that happened after the disintegration of the Soviet Union. So <coughs> in the Soviet era, language, uh, the Russian language was important for social mobility across the Soviet Union, though it varied to some extent across territories. But in general, if you wanted to succeed in the Soviet Union writ large, you needed to learn Russian, which is that a whole lot of people started to learn the language um, and develop the skills in the language regardless of their ethnic background. However, after the Soviet Union disintegrated, you have Russian shifting its position vis-a-vis uh, -vis this framework I've been developing here. So whereas Russian was the metropolitan language of the Soviet Union, it is no longer the metropolitan language in uh, Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, in Turkmenistan, or in Moldova. So Russian speakers are now the peripheral language speakers in these states, which means that they're going to be uh, the people who will potentially see changes in the status of their language, namely the Russian language, as potentially being detrimental to their life opportunities and thus leading them to be potentially more supportive of separatism. Uh, before I continue, I just want to briefly note, uh, just sort of hammer home this idea that language should not be conceptualized purely as a proxy for ethnic identity. So obviously it has a link to ethnic identity, but especially when we're talking about something like Russian, you have people of a variety of different groups learning the language, uh, developing skills in the language, uh, which means that they may have different preferences than their co-ethnics. So an ethnic Moldovan who speaks Russian will have different preferences over separatism than one who speaks Moldovan. And so if we just look at ethnic identity as being a proxy for a language or as language as being a proxy for ethnic identity, we're going to be missing a good portion of the story. Okay. Uh, so uh, without further ado, on to the case. So I'm going to be looking at uh, two separatist regions in Moldova. So Moldova is a country located between Ukraine and Romania. Uh, and the two separatist regions are Transnistria, which is wedged uh, between Moldova and Ukraine and then Gagabuzio, which is a territorial discontinuous <coughs> territory within Moldova proper, uh, located in the south. So a very, very broad overview of the context for this, uh, the, these cases is that Moldova was a Soviet-designated homeland of the Moldovans. Now, uh, Moldovan identity is a very complicated issue and one that they've written many articles and many books about. Uh, specifically, the Moldovan language and the Moldovan people are very closely related to Romanian. Uh, the Constitutional Court has actually decided that the Romanian and the Moldovan languages are the same languages. Um, I refer to it, uh, the people as Moldovans and the language as Moldovan uh, for sort of shorthand, especially because when I was doing the surveys in Transnistria, calling Moldovan Romanian gets you into trouble. So I'm referring to it as the Moldovan language. Uh, we can have a debate about uh, the veracity of that uh, during the question and answer if there is interest. Uh, the basic upshot, uh, but the important thing about all of this for this presentation is that Moldovan is a distinct language from Russian. So uh, Moldovan or Romanian, whatever you want to refer to it is, a Romance language uh, that is very distinct from the Russian language, which is a Slavic language. So all of these mechanisms I was describing earlier about a difficulty between switching between languages uh, very much holds for the Moldovan language vis-a-vis -vis Russian and Russian vis-a-vis -vis the Moldovan language. So in the 1980s, you have in Moldova, as in most uh, other Soviet uh, socialist republics, the beginnings of a nationalist movement, and one of the main claims of this, one of the main goals of this movement was to increase the status of the Moldovan language and revitalize the status of the language within Moldova. And so by 1989, you have the passage of a language law that privileged the Moldovan language over the Russian language and definitely was perceived as being such by uh, people in largely Russian-speaking territories, of which uh, Gargouzia and Transnistria were two. <coughs> Um, by 1990s, you have protests beginning in these territories and then an eventual uh, declaration of no longer subordination. So independence is a little tricky during this time. Uh, but, the, uh, but by 1991, both of these territories had declared themselves as being no longer subordinate to Moldova proper, which uh, glosses sort of as independence from Moldova, though they weren't declaring themselves independent from the Soviet Union. Um, and the first one that I want to focus on is Transnistria. So as I mentioned, it uh, separated from Moldova proper in 1990. Uh, following a brief but bloody civil conflict in 1992, it became de facto independent. Also, there was Russian intervention there, that which basically ended the conflict. Um, and since then, it, the writ of the Moldovan state has not really uh, carried in Transnistria, though most countries around the world, actually all countries around the world except for uh, other unrecognized states, uh, consider Transnistria to still be part of Moldova. Uh, separatism is still very much uh, salient in this territory. So in 2006, uh, they had a referendum with around 79% turnout, 
where 95% of the population stated that reintegration with Moldova was impossible, or 95% of the 79% that turned out for the referendum said that reintegration with Moldova was impossible, and then 97% uh, declared that they support Transnistrian independence, followed by uh, Russian annexation. If there's any survey design methodologists here, you know, this is kind of a classic double-barreled question, so it's kind of unclear what separatism in Transnistria actually means. Does it mean integration with Russia? Does it mean independence? Uh, and we can discuss that during the question and answer. Um, but the upshot is that there was, there is some evidence that uh, people in Transnistria support, uh, at the very least, not being reintegrated with Moldova. Uh, and then in 2014, you have the head of the Transnistrian uh, parliament uh, after the annexation of Crimea, requesting that Russia annex uh, Transnistria as well. Russia declined, but again, there's still this sort of salient uh, separatist uh, issue in the, in the region. So what does this all have to do with language? So Transnistria is a likely case for these dynamics that I was discussing at the beginning. So at the time of the disintegration of the Soviet Union, it was a multi-ethnic region, which was roughly equally divided among ethnic Moldovans, ethnic Ukrainians, and ethnic Russians. Now the demographics have changed slightly, um, but the key upshot of this is that by dint of the sort of demographic situation, as well as a variety of other uh, historical facets, most people in the region spoke Russian. Uh, so it was the, by far the prevalent lingua franca within the territory, and even among many ethnic Moldovans, it was the preferred language. Uh, at the same time, you also have Moldovans still being spoken by a more, minority of the a territory, but Russian was definitely the language for social mobility within Transnistria, and thus a reason why people in Transnistria uh, supported both the protest and the eventual uh, declaration of Transnistrian independence. Uh, accordingly, after uh, Transnistria seceded, uh, its constitution uh, held that it had three official and state languages, uh, namely Russian, Moldovan, and Ukrainian. So there's this clear link between the Transnistrian uh, state entity and uh, the protection of the Russian language. Uh, this also, after, uh, in the intervening 29 years now, uh, well, 23 years when I did the survey, uh, this sort of dynamic of a link between the Russian language and the Transeastern government has been maintained. So uh, in the survey that I conducted, and I'll be discussing in a bit more detail shortly, we asked questions about the degree to which you believe that the Transeastern government supports uh, given, a given language, as well as how much you believe that the Moldovan central government supports a language. And based on that, uh, I found that around 60% of the respondents uh, believe that the Transnistrian government supports Russian more than the Moldovan government. So there's this link between government, there's a popular link between the Transnistrian government and thus Transnistrian sovereignty and protection of the Russian language. And then this also translates into perceptions of language utility. So around 64% of the, the respondents uh, stated that they believe that Russian is used more frequently in Transnistria than it is in Moldova proper. Uh, the results for Moldovan are roughly the opposite. So most, uh, by far, uh, most respondents believe that Moldovan is used more frequently in Moldova than in Transnistria, and that the Moldovan government supports the Moldovan language more than the Transnistrian <coughs> government. So again, we have pretty strong uh, prima facie evidence that there is a perceived link between uh, the status of languages and Transnistrian sovereignty. So what we'd expect, given all of this, is that people who speak Russian in Transnistria should be more supportive of separatism than those who do not, and people who are proficient in Moldovan should be less supportive of separatism and Transnistrian independence than those who uh, do not speak the language. So the data that I'm looking at is from a 2013 survey, and we can discuss the methodology during the question and answer if there are questions. Um, in the survey, I asked uh, respondents a variety of questions regarding their preferences over separatist outcomes. So each of these were framed in the following way. So I asked, uh, well, my enumerators asked, uh, do you, uh, how much, to what extent do you agree with the following statements? And then they were presented with a five-point scale ranging from fully disagree to fully agree, uh, saying how much they agree with a given statement. And so some of these statements were, Transnistria should be an independent country, Transnistria should be a part of Moldova without autonomy, Transnistria should be part of Russia without autonomy, and so forth. So I have 10 outcomes overall, and I've got them all in the appendix of this presentation if people want to see additional outcomes, uh, but the results are roughly in line with each other, so I'm only going to be discussing two today. Uh, so the analysis that I'm going to be using is a Bayesian ordinal probit model, which is uh, actually in sort of functional form uh, relatively straightforward. 
So an orbital probit model is basically how uh, uh, we, we analyze the relationship between uh, a variety of factors and an outcome that is an ordered categorical uh, variable. So basically seeing uh, what is the relationship between things like language and ethnic identity and whether or not you support uh, an outcome, in this case, a transnistry and independence. So on the right-hand side, so as things that I think predict uh, Transnistrian uh, support for Transnistrian independence, I have a vector of linguistic covariates. So basically just uh, resp uh, responses to a question of how well do you think you speak a given language. And I just lop them off so that people who report being fully fluent are given a one. So I'm basically looking at the relationship between being fluent in Russian, Moldovan, and Ukrainian, and whether or not you support Transnistrian independence. Uh, one thing to note here is that these are not mutually exclusive categories, so you could be both a Russian and a Moldovan speaker, as in fact many of the respondents were. Uh, to make sure that these results for language are not just a function of ethnic identification, I also have a vector of ethnic covariates, which are just dichotomous indicators for whether or not you the ethnic identity with which a respondent primarily identified. So here I again have a, a vector for ethnic Russians, ethnic Ukrainians, and people who are ethnic Moldovans and people who don't identify as any of those groups. Uh, these actually are mutually exclusive categories, um, so you couldn't be both a Moldovan and a Ukrainian, though I did have some questions on the survey about more fine-grained measures of ethnic identification, uh, which we could potentially discuss during the question and answer also if there's interest. So uh, finally, I have a vector of controls, which are pretty standard in this type of analysis, just making sure that the relationship between language and this outcome that I'm observing is not just a function of a potential correlation with income, age, gender, or whether or not you have a higher education or you reside in an urban center. So what I'm going to be showing you is a posterior probability that a respondent with a given set of characteristics supports Transnistrian independence. Um, this is kind of a mouthful, so I might as well just go ahead and show you the results. Um, so what I'm showing here is basically our best guess that someone with a given set of ethnic and linguistic characteristics would support Transnistrian independence, so would agree or fully agree with the statement Transnistria should be an independent country. On the horizontal axis, I have a zero to one scale. So zero uh, indicates that there's no chance that someone with a given characteristic, set of characteristics would support this outcome, and a one represents perfect certainty that someone with these characteristics would support this outcome. Uh, on the vertical axis, I have uh, different ethnic and linguistic groups uh, so I've divided them first by ethnic identity. So this cell is just ethnic Moldovans, this cell is ethnic Ukrainians, and this cell is ethnic Russians. Uh, and then I've divided it by plausible linguistic ethnic combinations. So there are a few Moldovans in my sample who report speaking Ukrainian. So I'm only showing ethnic Moldovans who only speak Moldovan, speak Moldovan and Russian, or just speak Russian. Uh, and then these dots here represent our best guess about the probability that someone with these characteristics would support this outcome after controlling for everything else. And then the vertical lines are just a measure of uncertainty about this estimate. So right here, we have a result for an ethnic Moldovan, which indicates that they have around a 50% likelihood of supporting Transnistrian independence. Uh, but the range of uncertainty indicates that it's probably somewhere between 40 and 60%. Now the important thing here is that this is much lower than uh, ethnic Moldovans who also speak Russian. So an ethnic Moldovan who speaks Russian either as a bilingual or a monolingual has around a 70% likelihood of supporting Transnistrian independence, which is about 20% more likely than someone who does not speak Russian, which is very much in line with the theory that Russian fluency or people who speak Russian are going to be more supportive of separatism. Uh, for ethnic Russians, the results are a little bit more vague. This is partially due to the fact that in my sample there were no ethnic Russians who reported not speaking Russian fluently. Uh, so I can't really make any sort of causal argument about uh, the, the degree to which diff Russians who don't speak Russians would support independence. Um, but they're all relatively likely to support independence, which you'd expect given that they're all Russian speakers. Uh, if we look at ethnic Ukrainians, we see roughly the exact same pattern that we see with uh, ethnic Moldovans. So Moldov ethnic Ukrainians who only speak U uh, Ukrainian, so don't speak Russian, are much less likely to support separatism than ethnic Ukrainians who speak Russian either as a bilingual or as a monolingual. Uh, if we turn to a second set of results, and this is just showing results for the probability, so using the exact same analytic method, uh, that a Transnistrian would support integration with Russia without autonomy, so complete integration with Russia. 
uh, what we see is two things, uh, pretty well, three things pretty quickly. One is that if we toggle between uh, these results for independence and support for integration with Russia, you see that there is much lower, on average, support for integration with Russia than there is for independence. Again, I'd be happy to discuss like the multidimensionality of separatist preferences in Transnistria during the question and answer if there are more questions. Uh, the second thing you see is that there's generally uh, slightly less distinct differences between groups. So there was also a higher item non-response in this question than on other things, which means that the sort of claims that I can make are a little bit more limited on this outcome. Um, but the third and final thing, and probably the most important thing for uh, the sort of theory here, is that we see a similar pattern as with the previous. So ethnic Moldovans who only speak Moldovan are less supportive of separatism than those who speak Russian as a monolingual or bilingual uh, Russian Moldovan speakers. And same with Ukrainian vis-a-vis -vis the Ukrainian language. And then the interesting thing is that ethnic Russians who speak a language other than Russian, so bilingual Russian Ukrainian speakers, bilingual Russian Moldovan speakers, are less supportive of integration with Russia than just Russian speakers. So, which is also very much in line with this idea that uh, your preferences will be in line with the different languages you speak. Uh, and specifically, again, that speaking Russian preferentially to other languages is going to predict your support for integration or the separatist outcome. So, um, as you may have noticed, uh, there's a pretty strong correlation between being Russian and speaking Russian. Uh, so there are a lot of Moldovans and a lot of Ukrainians who speak Russian, but there's still this sort of potential conflation of Russian ethnic identity with uh, speaking the Russian language in Transnistria. So to sort of investigate how well this theory travels, um, I also conducted a survey in the second separatist region of Moldova, namely Gagamuzia, which again is located in the southern portion of Moldova. So Gagamuzia is the historical homeland of the Gagamuz. Um, as with every other sort of like historical homeland, like the degree to which is a historical homeland depends on your definition of historical and homeland. Um, but suffice it to say, the Gagwas have lived on this territory for a very long time. Uh, an important thing about the Gagwas is that they are a Turkic ethnic group. So historically, they have spoken a language that is closely related to Azerbaijani and Turkish, uh, and very far from both Russian and Moldovan, uh, again, in line with the theoretical discussion that I had a bit earlier. Uh, they're also the overwhelming majority of the population of Gagawusia, so around 82% of people in Gagawusia are ethnic Gagawus. <clears throat> now, the key and important aspect of this uh, population for this analysis that I'm presenting today is that during the Soviet Union, there was very little promotion of the Gagawus language within Gagawusia. So there was no education available in the Gagawus language during, until the late uh, 1980s, there was also virtually no media available for uh, Gagwu speakers uh, until the very late 1980s. Uh, what this meant is that many people in Gagawusia ended up speaking uh, Russian preferentially to Gagawus. So Russian became very tied to social mobility within Gagawusia, while Gagawus maintained sort of an effective relationship with uh, Gagawus identity, but was not as important for uh, one's life in Gagawusia. Um, so as you might expect, given this sort of general description, this, uh, the Moldovan language legislation also caused a negative reaction within Gagawusia. And so you have, by 1991, uh, Gagawusia also declaring that it was no longer subordinate to Moldova proper. Um, however, unlike Transnistria, in 1994, it reintegrated with Moldova and has since maintained uh, autonomous status within uh, Moldova. So the language situation in Gagawusia uh, has been maintained with some exceptions since the Soviet era. So there have been attempts at revitalizing the Gagawus language. Um, so there's more schooling available in Gagawus and, and so forth. Um, but at the same time, most research has indicated that the Gagawus language uh, retains a slightly lower social status, so prestige than the Russian language within the territory. So um, there was a recent dissertation, and I'm blanking on the name right now, that basically found that many people in Gagawusia have an effective emotional relationship to the Gagawus language, but consider the Russian language to be a more high status. And in my survey, I also found uh, roughly the sim similar results, though in a slightly less nuanced form than, than the dissertation I was just discussing. So basically, uh, in Gagawusia, uh, there's a very clear link in public perceptions of this link of the, of the Russian language to the territory and also to Gagawus government. Uh, so around 88% of the people in my survey stated that they believe the Gagawus government supports the Russian language more than the Moldovan government. 85% believe that the Russian language is spoken more frequently in Gagawusia than in Moldova proper. 
And importantly, around 21% believe that the Russian language is more spoken in Gargabuzia than the Gargabuz language. So there's some brief evidence from this that also uh, the Russian language maintains a slightly higher status in Gargabuzia than the Gargabuz language. And I should also mention that the Gargabuz constitution protects uh, the Russian, the Gargabuz, and the Moldovan language. So there's also an official link between uh, language and uh, the Gargabuz autonomy. So this is interesting for this analysis in the sense that it gives us a little bit more leverage on why language is important. So if language is a proxy for ethnic identity, as I was discussing earlier, then you'd expect Gargawu's proficiency to positively correlate with support for separatism because the Gargawu's language is a symbol of the Gargawu's people. If, however, the role of language is due to its uh, relationship to social mobility, then we'd expect Russian proficiency to be positively correlated with support for separatism. So the data, again, is from this 2013 survey. Um, and I also have a variety of outcomes that I analyzed, but here I'm just going to be presenting two again. And this was also in the exact same format as, the, as with Transnistria, so asking to what extent do you agree with the following statements. Uh, I took out some of the integration with Ukraine questions because it's not very plausible in Gagawuzia, but there's still questions about integration with Russia, as well as integration with Moldova and Gagawuz independence. So the model, again, is very similar to the model I was presenting a bit earlier, uh, but instead of having Ukrainian, I have the Gagawuz <coughs> language subbed in because uh, the Gargoyz language is salient in Gargoyz and Ukrainian is not. Slightly different vector of ethnic covariates, but roughly the same model. And what I'm going to be showing you is the past, first the posterior probability uh, that a respondent with a given set of ethnic and linguistic characteristics would support Gargoyz independence. Um, and I'm showing this also in the exact same format as previously, though with Gargoyz now at the bottom as opposed to uh, Russians and Moldovans still at the top. And so this is showing the relationship for ethnic Moldovans who speak different linguistic repertoires, uh, the probability or a best guess that they would support Gargawuz independence, so agree or fully agree with the statement Gargawuzia should be an independent state. Uh, what we again see is that Moldovan monolinguals are very unlikely to support this outcome, whereas Russian speakers, either as bilinguals or uh, monolingual Russian speakers, are much more likely to support Gargawuz independence. Uh, similarly, if we look at ethnic Russians, there's a really low sample of Russians in the sample because there's very few Russians in Gargawuzia, but this basically shows that, again, Russian speakers are all relatively supportive of Gargawuz uh, independence, uh, regardless of their ethnic background, uh, <coughs> among ethnic Russians. And then the interesting finding is as regards uh, ethnic uh, Gargawuz, in which you see that those who are most supportive of Gargawuz independence are those who speak both Russian and Kargawuz, um, which is roughly uh, statistically indistinguishable from those who just speak Russian. Uh, I don't know if you can see this back. Okay, good. Um, so basically, the upshot is that ethnic Kargawuz who speak Russian are much more supportive of separatism than those who only speak Kargawuz, um, which indicates that Russian in this context is more salient for support for separatism than the Kargawuz language. If we look at a different outcome, namely the degree to which uh, people in Gargawuzia, or pe my respondents, uh, supported Gargawuz autonomy, we see a similar pattern, though again, good news for uh, Moldovan territorial integrity, people are much more supportive of autonomy than they are of independence in general. So again, just to sort of frame this in a less sort of like provocative way, um, people in Gargawuzia really support autonomy, and those who are most supportive of gar continued Gargawuz autonomy are those who, who again speak Russian. So ethnic Gagawas who speak Russian either monolingually or bilingually, and then other people, including ethnic Moldovans, who speak uh, Russian. And then those who do not speak Russian, so Moldovan monolinguals and Gagawas monolinguals, are less likely than their co ethnics to support Gagawas autonomy. So the sort of final upshot here is that these analyses provide strong evidence of the center periphery linguistic dynamics that I was uh, describing earlier. So residents of Gargawuzia and Transnistria uh, perceive a link between territorial sovereignty and protection of the Russian language. And accordingly, Russian speakers are more supportive of separatism than non-speakers. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on, uh, so roughly over. So yeah, um, then I will, uh, I would be happy to discuss the degree to which these results travel to other regions of the former Soviet Union during question and answer. I have additional slides also about that. And then the sort of policy implications or the thing that I wanted to conclude on is that I think that it's really important when people are talking about language politics to consider language <coughs> as being important in and of itself. 
<coughs> the language is not just a smokescreen for the interests of external powers, um, it's also not just a proxy for ethnic identity, but something that must, but must be dealt with directly. Um, more specifically, I think given the characteristics of language, it's really important that we understand that for most adults, learning a new language is simply not going to be likely, and so it's important to accommodate these adults if a state isn't willing to devote the necessary time and resources to ensuring that people develop fluency in the language. And similarly, it's really important uh, that a state provide resources to schools and students to learn uh, the relevant languages within the society, and thus ameliorating cons for conflict. So thank you very much, and look forward to questions and comments. Thank you so much for your great presentation. Let's open the floor for questions. Please introduce yourself. Um, my name is Philip Remler. Um, I'm with Carnegie right now. Um, back to your slide on the results for Transnistria. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the actual number? I mean, I, can, I can, just can't imagine that there are many mon Moldovan monolingual people in Transnistria under the age of like 80. Right. Uh, so, do you have the because you know that's a historical issue, right? Um, so I don't have the cross tabs of age, so I can't tell you that age. Well, is, not age, yeah. but just yeah, the num the numbers themselves. So there are around twenty people who report being monolingual, uh, yeah, not Russian speakers. So uh, monolingual Moldovan speakers is less, but there are around twenty people in the sample, so a relatively small proportion of people who report not speaking Russian. Right. So yeah. So yeah, you're definitely right that that's a relatively small group. However, the thing is, is that they have very, very distinct preferences from everyone else in the territory. Right. The one thing I would note as a historical, there are a lot of historical aspects to all of this, obviously, yeah. but that um, much to the chagrin of the Romanians, um, when they do surveys in Ukraine of um, uh, language speakers, pe people self-identify as Moldovans and Moldovan speakers and not Romanian speakers. This is historical, it's because it's, it was all part of the Soviet Union. Um, but I think that um, has a bearing, I think, on, on, on uh, and, and the whole question of union with Romania has a bearing on these questions. Right. right. So <clears throat> that's definitely true. I mean, so like Gagawuzio's constitution actually has a clause that it can declare, that it reserves the right to declare independence if Moldova tries to reunify with Romania. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> historical issues with Romania among the Gagawuz population. So these issues of Romania and Romanian integration are definitely very salient here. Um, the survey didn't include a lot of questions about that, so I can't speak directly to it, but I definitely agree that this is something that is important. Hi, Alex. I'm Alex from Washington. I was wondering if you can talk more about, to, to piggyback on this question, more about the age differences, like the age and the and the language issue, like how much, how many young Transnistrians actually even speak Romanian. You can uh, allude to that when you're talking about um, the importance for states to to sort of like promote that the population should be bilingual, multilingual. Well, do the Transnistrians, does, does the Transnistrian government even teach Romanian? In Transnistrian schools, do you, do, does that young Transnistrian even have the opportunity to learn Romanian, or do they have to like, cross the, the river to, to learn it? Yeah, they definitely don't learn Romanian, but they do like, learn <laughs> Moldovan, right? So there are Moldovan medium schools, and there are Moldovan uh, classes in other schools. Okay. So there are people who do speak, uh, young people who do speak the Moldovan language within uh, Transnistria. Though, obviously, Again, like there's that's part of why I controlled for both age and urban rural distinctions because there are more Moldovan speakers, especially in rural areas, than there are in urban areas, and in rural areas also in Transnistria that often tends to be older people. So there's definitely a relationship between age and other aspects um, and these these things. But I do think that there's still uh, a relationship between language as is in this. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kyle, kind of just, sorry if this is, I get this question all the time, but just, do you think this idea travels to Ukraine in, in terms of Russian speakers? Yeah, so Ukraine is uh, definitely an important issue of this uh, linguistic, uh, sort of center peripheral linguistic dynamics. It's a little bit trickier than the cases I'm describing here because of the similarities between the Russian and the Ukrainian language. So switching between Russian and Ukrainian is easier than uh, switching between Romanian or Moldovan and Russian and U 
sorry, getting all the languages mixed up. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Or definitely between Gaguas and, and uh, Romanian. Um, so as a result, I think the dynamics there are slightly different in the sense that um, I think David Layton's sort of description of this having a larger sort of identity component and desire to differentiate the two groups is playing a larger role than it is in a place like Transnistria or Gargabuzia where the languages don't really need to be differentiated um, because they're just completely different language families. Um, that said, I think it is worth noting that there were protests in Ukraine after the uh, language legislation or the repeal of the, the legislation that allowed regional language choice in Ukraine, which indicates that there is some dynamics and that language is potentially playing a role there. Though again, I definitely don't want to say that uh, Donbass secessionism is purely a function of language, but not to diminish the role of Russia in that, in that case. Yeah, thank you. Really interesting stuff. I have uh, a couple questions. Um, I guess one would be, I mean, I'd like to take you up on your offer to talk about, uh, you know, the implications, uh, you know, maybe in Russia itself. I mean, mm -hmm. I'd uh, be interested to see, you know, your thoughts as this play out kind of in the republics or anything like that. Um, and then I guess the, uh, the other question is kind of uh, how important is this relative to other drivers of separatism? Um, I mean, do you think that this is like kind of the, the language issues are the primary drivers of separatism or, you know, if you also, in, you know, because your argument is it's, it's distinct, right, and it's, a, it's a clearly a cause, uh, but how does it stack up against kind of, you know, just general ethnic identification, um, you know, or other, you know, language identity, you know, identification, but not actual speaking of the language, you know, it, I mean, you know, do you have any basis or, you know, thoughts just on kind of how it stacks up, uh, you know, is it just one among many? Is it like primary drivers? One of the more important ones? Uh, that kind of thing. Right. So thank you very much for both of these questions. I'm going to talk about the first one, the second one first. Um, so here, um, yeah, so one thing that you do notice in both of these regions is that there is an ethnic identity component of separate, support for separatism in both Transnistria and Gagawusia. So uh, ethnic uh, Russians tend to be more supportive of separatism than ethnic Ukrainians, so regardless of their linguistic capabilities. Um, though the magnitude of the difference among ethnic, uh, between language groups is higher than the magnitude of the effect of ethnicity. So I definitely think that other things do play a role in determining uh, the, the support, support, your repertoire of support for separatist outcomes. Um, though I think that language, at least as I formulated it in this analysis, is less important. Now, the other sort of bigger question is that there are, are there a lot of other sort of primary things that people consider as being important to separatist mobilization. So identification with a region, identification with an ethnic group, uh, perceptions of social mobility. And my argument is that language often underlies a lot of these perceptions. So especially as I was arguing with social mobility, your perceptions of social mobility are going to be a function of your language, but they're also gonna be a function of other things like how well educated you are and the economic situation of your region. So I'm actually, <clears throat> conducting some analyses uh, that I haven't quite completed, looking at the link between social mobility prospects, uh, more specifically looking at your perceptions of individual social mobility in your region vis-a-vis -vis the larger uh, Moldova, as well as your perceptions of the economic strength of your region vis-a-vis -vis Moldova proper and support for separatism and seeing how language relates to those. And then also how language relates to identification with other region and, uh, and ethnicity and how to combine this all leads to different types of support for different, different levels of support for different types of separatism. Um, and so the sort of like causal pathway here is sort of difficult to sort of directly analyze, and especially with my survey, which has a relatively small sample, like going into the fine details of seeing how exactly these things, like to do a causal mediation analysis or something like that is just not gonna be practical with these data, uh, though I tried in my thesis. <laughs> uh, they, uh, yeah, so I, I think that, that there are a variety of factors that can lead an individual to support separatism, so there's a whole lot of air term in this, but I think that language is something that's important and an important element of support for separatism uh, in, in, the, in these cases, and I think more generally. So to go to your first question, uh, which is Russia, let me, that's the trick about having, oops, yeah. So uh, this is actually what I presented uh, two weeks ago, um, but I was just at the, the New Voices workshop in Russia, which is basically looking at the relationship between um, the salience of language and the proportion of speakers of the language in Russia um, <clears throat> for using data from the 1990s. Um, and basically, for the purposes of today, uh, the only analysis I have is basically showing when language became salient. So 
I'm going to take a couple of steps backward because I jumped right into the, the fray of this. But basically, the idea is that in Russia there are these ethnic territories where they generally, where historically the main group of these territories has spoken a language distinct from that of Russian, Russia, that of Russia, namely Russian. And the interesting thing about these territories is that the salience of language, so the degree to which speaking uh, one of these titular languages, so Tatar and Tatarstan, Karelian and Karelia, is salient for your preferences over separatism, so the degree to which a speaker versus a non-speaker of language uh, differs vis-a-vis -vis their preferences over separatism varies across regions. And so if we actually look at this graphic right here, we see that there's pretty wide variation in the degree to which language matters. So from a place like Karelia, uh, a speaker of Karelian is actually much less likely to support separatism than a non-speaker, uh, whereas in a place like Chechnya, a speaker of Chechnya is much more likely to support Ch uh, Chechen uh, well, at that time, Chechen, so, so these are data from 1990 and 1993, actually, uh, would be much more likely to support uh, Chechen separatism than a non-speaker. Uh, and the interesting thing, and I think the more sort of broad message of this for um, the study of language politics, is that this is correlated with the proportion of speakers of a language in a territory. Um, <clears throat> so the basic upshot here is that uh, in regions where there are very few speakers of a titular language, so like Karelia, Kalmukia, there's no salience of language, so language does not matter for your preferences over separatism, whereas in places where there are a lot of speakers, it makes a very big difference, which I think also gives a pretty important scope condition to this analysis, which is that like a single monolingual does not a revolution make, mm -hmm. right? So there needs to be uh, a critical mass of people for language to become salient. There was a question by Yamina, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to go back to um, this question of social mobility mm -hmm. that you um, uh, unpacked in the um, theoretical part. And just, uh, it's interesting to see <coughs> how the, um, so the you can understand how uh, this link to social mobility becomes a driver behind separatism. But then, how does the situation change after the separation? After the session, right? So, what is the situation like in uh, Transnistria and particularly in Gagosia, where um, the um, ethnic, um, sort of the language situation is more complex because of the Gagosian language. Of that. So what is the um, social mobility like now in these two regions in right. relation to language? Yeah, so I think um, there's been a couple of works recently about social mobility in Gagosia. It's still very much tied to the Gagavus, uh, to the Russian language. So getting a high-prestige job in Gagosia is still being perceived as being linked to, to speaking Russian. Um, though the Gargoyles language has made great strides, well, great strides might be, but has made strides um, in sort of becoming a more prominent language within the territory, though not as much as the Gargoyles uh, nationalists would like. Um, and so I think the situation has not changed nearly as much as they would have liked it to, um, or the Gargoyles, uh, the people who promote the Gargoyles language would have liked it to. Uh, the other sort of important element here is the Moldovan language. So there's been a lot of uh, issues in Moldova with uh, low-quality Moldovan language education in Gargoyusia, which means that a lot of Gargoyus students uh, don't actually pass the, the exams necessary to study in high-quality Moldovan institutions and end up going to Russia or going to, going to Turkey, which again is sort of like one of the things I was mentioning here. So not speaking Moldovan definitely hurts their social mobility within Moldova proper and leads them to other alternatives. Back to your slide again about uh, the um, proficiency in, uh, in Transnistria. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the question on education reminded me there are, as you know, two um, sets of education in Moldovan in Transnistria. Mm -hmm. One is run by the Transnistrian government and is in the Cyrillic script, mm -hmm. but all, and all the textbooks are basically from Transnistria and promoted Transnistrian um, worldview, you might say, especially a view of history. The other set of s schools are uh, run by the Moldovan government and are taught, and the language is taught in the Latin script as Romanian. Um, this is under agreement, be, uh, uh, a very <laughs> uh, tense agreement between the Moldovan and Transnistrian authorities. Um, how do you factor for that in your findings on monolingual Moldovan speakers? I mean, are there, of the people, did you, did you drill down 
within that number to the people who'd been to the Latin script schools and the people who'd been to the Cyrillic script schools and so forth. Because like, one would assume that those within the Cyrillic script schools would be much more in favor of Transnistrian in independence. Right. So um, there's two sort of levels <coughs> of that question. So one is that in the survey, I did include a variety of questions about written proficiency. So what I'm showing here right now is just a dichotomous, a very rough indicator of spoken proficiency, uh -huh, right. in which case there might be an identity component to be how you were taught in it. Though, in fairness, uh, this arose also in 2013, which means that people who started getting educated in the Latin script would be relatively young and probably not terribly many of them in the analysis. Um, but I did ask questions about like which script you preferred to use and how well you could write in the different ones. Now, I haven't actually gone in and analyzed the dis differences between those who were better at writing in the Cyrillic script and the Latin script, but I definitely think that that's something that's worthwhile pursuing. Um, I did ask questions about like whether or not people perceived Moldovan and Romanian as being distinct languages, and in Transnistria there was a much higher proportion that believed that they were distinct languages uh, mm -hmm. than, than in Gargantia, and then in Moldova proper. And so on. Thanks. Can I add in? Follow on that, and also asking you for for your perception of the literature on the Baltic states and the, the Russian minority mm. that because that has been quite studied, and the difference is that because there was no conflict there, right? So you don't have this kind of element of dissociation that make that, for example, schools are separated, textbooks are separated. So you have um, what one of your policy recommendation, like you know helping adults to learn the language and being sure that young people at school will be learning the, the titular language. I mean, for Moldova, it's difficult to do because they have been a de facto state, while for Latvia and Estonia, in a sense, they had the possibility to do it. They didn't do it with adults, but they did it for young, young uh, people. So I was wondering if you could comment on the literature like David Lightin and so on on this on the situation of the, the Russian minority in the Baltic state, and also how do you articulate that with people who come from more the kind of uh, uh, cultural anthropology field about, in fact, explaining about people shift a lot of their identity or ling ling language identification depending if there is a big social group around them, right? So if you are a Russian speaker alone in a small town, in a sense, you are invited to shift to the titular language just because your ability to communicate or have a kind of social mobility is limited. While if you are among a big group of Russian speakers, in a sense, you are not invited to shift. And he had interesting you know, comments about a family trajectory, right? If someone in the family begin kind of shifting the language, you have more chance to have the whole family becoming bilingual. Mm -hmm. While if a family decide to stay only in Russia, then in a sense, the, the, an individual will, will, will stay inside the family trajectory. So this kind of element that are more kind of cultural or, or social, and I was wondering how you could articulate them with your own uh, research. Right, yeah, no, I think this question of shifting linguistic identification is really, really important, and I think it's also very much aligned with sort of David Layton's work about the rational choices that people make vis-a-vis -vis language. My big sort of distinction with David Layton is that I don't see shifting languages as necessarily being as easy as he sort of presents it in his book. So his argument is that people make choices about the languages that they want to learn. My argument is that it's not often a choice for adults. So people will decide, to, but I do totally agree that the decision to even try is a function of the cultural surroundings, as he argues, which is that people who, uh, so especially in places like Kazakhstan, as he argued, uh, as he sort of like his game theory modeling language would put it, like defecting from the Russian language carried greater consequences than say in a place like Estonia or the other Baltic states. So I think that that's, that's definitely individual choices and in the, the situation in which people find themselves plays a role in the decision about whether or not you're going to try to learn a language, um, but the degree to which that's actually a full choice is something that I think is, is not necessarily true. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's also a question of how much <coughs> you would be accepted by people within your surrounding, right? And then, especially in places like this, you also have sort of uh, uh, segregation by choice in a lot of cases of people moving to places where other people speak similar languages, which also makes it a little bit more difficult to mm -hmm. um, have this conversion. Uh, with regard to the Baltics, 
I mean, I think the Baltics are really, really interesting, um, and I think that they, they show pretty strong evidence of a couple of different things. So one is that um, the sort of upward mobility prospects, especially among the youth tied to the EU, I think definitely plays a role in the link between potential conflict among especially Russian-speaking uh, populations in that territory, and also I think diminishes it. Um, and then also uh, the lack of territorial autonomy, I think, is also something that, that has sort of Diminish the cause for potential conflict in the territory, though uh, in those ter in those countries, um, or, though like it's not obviously completely decisive in the sense that we do have this conflict in eastern Ukraine, as well as Gagauzia was not a territorial like mm -hmm. a single territorial unit during this integration of the Soviet Union. But I think both of those factors have made uh, the potential cause or the potential salience of language for conflict and separatism much lower in in the Baltics than elsewhere. We have last question, yes, sir. Very quickly, you said that you interviewed uh, 510 person people yeah. in, in uh, Transnistria. I'm just curious, how easy or difficult was it to interview 577 people in Transnistria? How open were they to actually be interviewed by an American who I'm sure ha speaks very fluently Russian? Oh, oh, sorry, let me be clear. I wasn't doing any of these interviews. Okay. So I had a, sur a local survey organization do the interviews for okay. me. And they were, uh, all of the people in both Gargouzia and Transnistria were fully bilingual. Okay. So they could do interviews in either Moldovan, Russian, or uh, Ukrainian, Transnistria. And if the interview responded didn't speak one of the languages that they spoke, we found another person to interview those people. Uh -huh. So it wasn't me doing that. Okay. But still in Transnistria, the response rate wasn't stellar. So it was around a 20% response rate, mm -hmm. um, which is actually pretty standard for Transnistria. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not the most open. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Well, on that, I think it's time for us to conclude. So I wanted to thank Kai for his great presentation and you for being here today. So please join me in thanking. <laughs>